Good afternoon, everyone. Good comrade, Senior Leader of United Life Church. On behalf of Sheena, Stephen, and Maria, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you this afternoon as we celebrate the life of David. We'd also like to thank Reverend Tim Saunders and Sheen Baptist Church for the use of the church this afternoon. During his 58 years, David touched the lives of people all around the world. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here today, quite literally. He saved my life from drowning as a rather overconfident young boy trying to show that he could swim when he couldn't. He was also later my pastor at Chief Community Church. And there are many more of us who would say that his input into our lives was life-changing. We'll be hearing from some of those folks later in this service. But David would be the first to say that whatever had happened through him was as a result of what had happened to him. The discovery of the amazing and almost unbelievable love of Jesus, who died to save him and who rose from the dead so that David could be with him forever. And as we meet now, that is where he is, fully alive and completely restored. Yes. And so you'll notice that this service will have a tone of celebration mm. and of thankfulness for yeah. all that Jesus has done. And uh, feel free to respond as you will today. Tears, that's, that's just spot on, that's fine. You grieve too. But joy and laughter and celebration absolutely fitting too. We're here to celebrate all that God has done in and through David. And so Stephen and the band are going to lead us. I invite you all to, to stand up and join us and open your heart and put it to the Lord as we worship him this afternoon.
Now, David in his 20s liked to bundle. <laughs> He'd go around like this, you know, and he, and he saw both of his friends who, he, who seemed to be going through a bit of a tough time or something. He was a bit tense. He'd say, Come on, man, get it out of your mind. And he sort of keep sort of nudging me like this. Anyway, uh, one night we were going around to see a friend of ours, uh, uh, Mike uh, Walters, and uh, Mike had got a very serious guy, sort of staying with him. He was all like Fisher Pokey type guy, if those of you remember that, you know, not serious sort of guy. And uh, he liked playing the guitar, and he very foolishly left his guitar near the door in, uh, in uh, Mike's, Mike's house. Now we had this old having late at night, so we, we, we knocked on the door, and it, so it was a bit like um, Cluso and Cato. And there were two Catos, so it's me, Dave, and Cluso was uh, Mike Walters, so sorry Mike. But, you know. um, so anyway, uh, he opened the door, bang, we just smashed him through the door. door. He gets flying back, this guitar, we're twang, twang, twang with this guitar broken to several pieces. And uh, anyway, so we we're in absolute hoops of laughter, and of course we dutifully uh, paid for the guitar. Um, and I say, this was always going on like this, you know, this is bit. And then uh, there was another time we were in Chief Park, we got a, like a little games afternoon, on Sunday afternoon, and Dave was in the games, and this time it was to a young Dave Proverb. 
who was 14 years old and, you know, was very, very good at judo. In fact, I think it was black belt. I think you see that. Anyway, so David, like this, and then suddenly David got just this blur. It was like Bruce Lee. It was his blur. Lift his foot up, lift him back, and there's Dave, horizontal about that far off the ground. <laughs> Bang, he goes down. And just, again, absolutely used to laughter. And, you know, that's the one thing I got to leave with. Dave was always a fun-loving person, all the way, right the way throughout his life. But he was somebody who was always playing jokes, but he was also just somebody who could really take the joke as well. The first time I met Dave, the first time I saw him, he was leading worship at Elmbrook Chapel wearing a, a mint green shirt, beach shorts, and flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it didn't fit with the right experience at church either. <laughs> but despite this dress sense, there was, there was just something very attractive about him. He was worshipping 100% and I wanted some of what he had. And he was infectious, he was bold, he was fun and he was loud and he encouraged other people to be the same. And he has to take at least some responsibility for how I am now. Because <laughs> at the time I was very shy. And, and I remember one of the time he, he made me dress up as a clown wander around the streets of North Burchie village to advertise the opening of this new bakery. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there was another time he made me dress up in lycra and, and ride, ride my bike to the front of the church to um, advertise the fact that we were doing a sponsored bike ride with Crop Cry in the Dark, a remaining children's charity. And he also gave my wife a job in the church I think on the basis that she obviously didn't have enough to do at home. <laughs> but what he did was, he made us see what we could do by encouraging us to try it. Mm -hmm. And he and Sheena took us to Tadjal, I remember, to Tadjal, as part of the children's ministry team. And I found myself praying for children and leading discussion groups and meeting God and seeing children saved and come to know Jesus, including my own children. And he encouraged the idea of family services and the expansion of Sunday school from something which was something of a babysitting service to, to something where children could encounter God themselves. <coughs> and he encouraged my daughters to <coughs> singing and dancing. And he encouraged my son and his love of electronics to be part of the tech team, part of the family of the church. And we just want to honour the fact that he's encouraged our family. He's been our number one fan. He's accepted us as we are. He's always seen the potential in us. And he's always encouraging us to go for it. And I think his legacy for our family has been, you want to do what? <laughs> Great! Let's do it! And he remains for us a father figure. Although one who never quite grew up himself. <laughs> so my memory is of David, pastor at Chief Community Church. Well, we come to Chief Community Church with great joy, and I want to speak on behalf of all my friends, not just Nigel and myself and Luke and Gabby, but all my friends I know would say this. We came to church with a joy in our heart and an expectancy of what God would do in those meetings. Because David was a man that was led by the Holy Spirit. And he would do or say whatever the Holy Spirit told him to do. So it's always a great joy as we turned up on Sunday, not quite knowing what the Lord was going to do this week. <laughs> and in cell groups, our cell group meetings with David and Sheila and Stephen. A wonderful time. David had an amazing voice and he was a true worshipper of God. We would meet with the Lord week after week in the cell room and often sense the presence of angels with us. David taught us how to know intimacy with Father, with Jesus and with Holy Spirit. 
And for that, I will always be eternally thankful to him. Mission times abroad, again with David and Sheila and Stephen, but awesome times when we saw the Lord do amazing miracles and amazing salvation. We all joined in awesome uh, rejoicing together. David and, I, and David's family have had a caravan over the last few years. Stephen flying kites with, Steve, uh, with David along the sea wall. Uh, Sheila going for walks and more recently Maria coming along too. And we had, you'd hear David's voice roaring with laughter at the different things we'd get up to. David, there was always an abundance with, whether it was food, whether it was painting, whether it was gardening, he was full of life and full of vibrance. The life of the Lord lived in him powerfully. David loved the Lord, he loved his family, he loved his friends and he loved life. And we loved sharing his life with him. We'd all been battling through in faith, absolutely believing for a miracle. Some are still believing for a resurrection. <laughs> But the Lord said to me a few words that morning, and um, I didn't share it because I didn't think it was the right time. But um, this is what he said, and this is what Stephen asked me to read. It was exactly two weeks before we went to be with the Lord. And I said to the Lord, Lord, if you could say anything to David, what would you say? And he said this, Come sing a song to me, David, and I will sing along with you. We'll recount our wonderful journey and share of the one ahead to. There's so much I want to tell you of my love so deep for you. There's so much I want to show you of the joy I found in you. Come sing a song to me, David, and I'll sing along with you. You're more precious than all the stars in the sky, my precious one, my precious son. It's about a few words that we can say to each one of us to, that David impacted our lives. Uh, this is a memory um, that the Lord will never forget, David. He was one of my best buddies. Um, we just laughed and laughed and laughed so many times together. We just cried, you know, the stupid things we used to get up to. Um, I've done ministry trips today, and uh, we worship together, we lay hands on the sick, we've seen incredible things together. But just but to give you a glimpse of some of the fun things we used to do. We were down in Devon, and uh, one night I said to David, you're going to go hunting, you're going to go shooting. So David and Steve were with us, and it was like Dave turned into Rambo on steroids. <laughs> we got to a point where I put the gun in his hand, and I said, Dave, listen, you've got to look for the reds of their lights. So it was like a green haze came over Dave's face. And I went out to the fields with him, I was walking up the field, and all of a sudden the rifle was up. And I said, you might be shooting rabbits. All of a sudden there's these eyes, and they were green eyes. Now for anybody who's a farmer, you know that that is sheep. <laughs> and I said to David, David, what do you think you're doing? I think it's just so gun ho you wanted to take down the sheep. And I just had to remind David that the sheep were out of season. So that was one memory of David and Steve could recall this. Um, another one, I'm sure that uh, David hit part of his DNA birthed in Alton Towers. The reason I say that is because a number of us have gone on mission trips with David. And as some of you might know, um, who know me, I don't like flying. But David, as we were going up through the turbulence, I was praying in tongues and saying, God, just help us, you know, thinking the plane was being held up by my prayers. And over in the corner there was David going, Whee! What are you talking about? And the plane was rolling around, not grabbing all the head of my wife. And I just said, David, I just want to strangle you. Shut up. And David just loved life. But the one thing I did learn with David, that he was fearless. And I would say to you, if you spend that time with David, cherish him. Because David taught me to fear God, to love God, to, when there is a need, to move in on something prophetic, move in on a healing, move in on something in God, do it. And just ask God to be with you at that time. And he does. He says, open your mouth and I'll fill it. Many times David would say to us, get out there, are you pray for them. You know, what's God saying to you? Prophesy over them. 
And boy, what a training day. But Dave is fearless. He loved flying, he loved hunting, and he even loved fishing. And that's another story. But hey, Dave, many of us here, I would say today, you know, bless you, bro. Guarantee he's in glory in some rock band. That's what I David and like. So, uh, yeah, bless him and bless Sheena and Steve and uh, just a small part of our life that's made it very precious knowing you. Dave, Sheena, and Steve. Bless you. my own minutes today. Uh, I've got to read some tributes from some other people. And the first tribute is from someone that many people will know, Steve and Christina Stewart from Impact Nations in Canada. And this is what they write. We don't know what we like doing with Dave Moore, ministering together or playing together. Like so many of us can testify, David had a great influence on our lives. He was a delight to watch as again and again his prophetic gift brought life, vision and hope to so many people. This past January in India, Vijay and Naraja, whom David had prophesied over at length three years ago, brought out that prophecy and told us how line by line each detail of that prophetic word had been fulfilled. For me, whenever David and I ministered together, I felt a great anointing and authority flowing through me, more than at other times. I think it was simply a case of some of David's anointing rubbing off on those around him. David has been a dear and precious friend to both of us, Steve and Christina Stewart, for a number of years now. He was a source of both encouragement and laughter. Our vacations with David and Sheena were always a highlight. Like all of you, we are sad to say goodbye to such a special friend. However, also like you, we are thankful for the rich and powerful deposit that David invested in so many lives. He was a man of great faith and of the Spirit, who encouraged us all to live by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We will miss him greatly, yet we live in anticipation of a future day of glorious reunion. And the second tribute is from Nola and Alan Collis, their pastors of a community church in Australia. What a privilege it is for Alan and I to join with you and others around the world today to celebrate the amazing life of our brother David. David impacted the lives of multitudes around the world. He inspired, he blessed, and he gave more of himself to others than most of us will ever know. He was truly a kingdom man. I often think that when God was giving out gifts, David must have been somewhere near the front of the line. <laughs> He was an international prophet, a worship leader, a musician, a preacher, an artist, a chef, so gifted and willing to share those gifts to help others know God in a deeper way. I could spend hours, this is Noah, I could spend hours telling stories about encounters with David that would have you rolling around laughing. His sense of humour never ceased to amaze me. His laugh was infectious. He had a perspective of seeing the funny side of life, always. I remember one little church that the Palethorpe family drove me to so that I could minister. After the service, I prayed for people and a little old lady was slain in the spirit, but she took me with her, pinning me to the ground. She would not let me up. Stephen rushed to peel the lady off me, but David just laughed and laughed. On my wedding day, when I had, I had the privilege of having David walk me and give me away, walk me down the aisle that is, as soon as I saw all the people and the minister, I got nervous and said, Gee David, I'm not sure about all this. 
He just tightened his grip on me. Without even looking at me, he said, get it together. <laughs> and just keep walking. All the while, he just kept smiling. After that, I was fine. <laughs> David lived life to the full. He was adventurous, fun, and even, ho even hopeful that those around him would live their lives to the glory of God. The greatest way we can honour him is by following his example of loving God and loving others, by giving our lives for the kingdom. To Sheena, Stephen and Maria today, we tell you that we love you, we pray for you, and we thank you for sharing this wonderful man of God with us. May God bless you, comfort you, and may you over these coming months meet multitudes from the nations who have been impacted by the life of your husband, father, and father-in-law. To David we say, farewell. See you in glory, dear friend. Much love on this special day. So, I have a tribute from the family. I'd like to invite Hazel. Uh, Michael's coming up with me in case I crack up. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I think most of you have known David in his work with the church, his wonderful artwork, and perhaps at Dream Pastries. But you may be interested to hear something about him growing up as the youngest of four children. I was, I think, a rather self-obsessed older sister, and my childhood memories are rather hazy. I do remember teasing the other three and beating them up until they screamed. <laughs> that, of course, had to stop when they all grew taller and bigger than me. <laughs> My sister Dee, who lives in New Zealand, has a better recolle recollection of David as a child and teenager. And she has sent me her thoughts, which I will read out to you in a moment. As you know, Dave was a great chef. Possibly initially born out of necessity. <laughs> our dear mother was brought up in India with servants at her beck and call, and she didn't cook in the loosest sense of the word until she came to the UK with our dad in 1948. Some of her food combinations would have been an inspiration to the character Letitia Cropley in the Vicar of Dibley series. <laughs> Fish fingers and marmite, anyone? Oh. <laughs> anyway, what started as self-preservation turned into a wonderful career with David working at amongst other places at Dorchester and at the cabinet office in Whitehall for Michael Hesseltine, for whom I must say he had scant regard. <laughs> there are so many things about David that come to mind, but I think my sister Dee says them better than I can in her recollections which she has sent me to read to you. She's sorry she can't be here today to join in the celebration of David's life. D writes, David, from the moment you came into this world, you seemed special. The baby of our family, with your dark curls and beautiful brown eyes. You were so placid, and I remember you sitting in your pram for hours surveying the world. You and I were close as children, being only 16 months apart, although I always got the better of you in our childhood fights. Sorry about that, Dave. We had an old piano, and I remember you sitting next to Dad as he played Hang Down Your Head Son Dooley. You decided you wanted to learn to play, and you went and did a paper round and paid for all your piano lessons yourself. Across the road, there lived a wonderful family called the Olivers. They would hold Bible classes every Tuesday evening, and Mum, Dave and I used to go along. I must admit, I only went for the cakes that were served <laughs> Ruth Oliver was an amazing cook. When Billy Graham, the American evangelist, visited the UK, Ruth and Bill took David and me along. Dave was 10 and I was 11. It was wonderful, and Dave and I went forward to be converted. From that moment on, Dave's faith never wavered, whereas I fell by the wayside. We owned a caravan in Selsey Bill, 
and the family would head off there in the summer holidays. During one of these holidays, my sis Hazel had met a boy she fancied, and she took off one evening with her little brother David in tow, who she was using as her alibi. <laughs> she got into deep trouble when Mum sent our stepdad out to search for them. David, bless him, never spilled the beans. Dave joined the church choir and took great glee in telling me that not only did they get paid sixpence, but were given sweets for their services. When David was quite young, he decided he wanted to be a chef as his love of food was great. They didn't do cooking at Glastonbury Boys School, so he used to come over to my school for cookery lessons. The only boy to join all the girls. He left school and attended Westminster College where he excelled in patisserie. <coughs> At weekends, Dave used his musical talents and sang in local pubs. I would go along and love to hear him sing When Irish Eyes Are Smiling, one of his favourite songs. He joined, a, he joined a local drama group and I watched many of his productions. The one I especially remember was No No Nanette, where he had the leading role. He was brilliant. I was so proud of him. David seemed to know his own destiny. He told us he would be married by the time he was 30, and lo and behold, along came Sheena. They were married in 1984, when David was 10 days off his 30th birthday. Two beautiful children were born, Stephen and Christina. When Christina left at three years old to be with the Lord, it was David and Sheena who offered me comfort, and their faith shone like a bright light around them. Dream Pastries was opened the same year and I immigrated with my family to New Zealand. When our brother Brian was diagnosed with terminal cancer, David and Hazel slipped across the many oceans to give support to the rest of the family. And David spent many hours by his brother's side, praying with him and giving, give, and gifting him the new spirit-filled life Bible, and witnessing Brian being born again and renewing his faith. It was wonderful us four children being together again after so long. Okay, I'm alright. <laughs> <laughs> David, from choir boy to chef to baker and from pastor to missionary, you've led an inspirational life. The world is poorer for having lost you, but we're richer for having known you. I'm so proud to call you my brother. You love me, sister D. A lifelong song of David was Amazing Grace. As he celebrated what Jesus meant to him. And he ended up singing that song all over the place, yeah. in uh, weddings, in funerals, here, there, and everywhere. We're not going to have the bold tracks, we're going to have the powerful family <laughs> singers uh, now. And this will be presented to us, but there will be an opportunity as the song rolls on for us uh, to join in. And then when, when that's finished, then uh, Jonathan, my brother, and Tony will be continuing to do further tributes and prayers.
Well, friends, family, it's a real honor to be here and to just share a few words about someone who was, for me first and foremost, a friend. A tremendous support, a tremendous friend to our family over many, many years. It seems almost impossible to me that he, David, has had a huge impact on my own life over some 40 years. I don't feel that old. <laughs> But the reality is that right from when I was a little child, up to this present, well, to more recent weeks, David all the time was just speaking encouragement, speaking life, bringing life, bringing love, bringing comfort, bringing encouragement from the word God. I, apparently he used to bounce, I don't really remember it very well, but he used to bounce me on his knee <laughs> as a little baby. But um, of course, I don't have too many memories of that. And, uh, but over the years, as, as of course as I grew up, there were so many things that helped, so many leaps, so many hurdles he helped me to overcome. I had a, when I look back at it in reality over my life, I can see so many different fears that were in my life that he helped me overcome. Remarkably, I had a terrible fear of, uh, of water. I'm like my brother who tried to drown himself, you know, and David rescued him. <laughs> David, I was much more cautious sticking my toe in the water. Uh, but David taught me uh, to swim. In essence, and help me to overcome that fear. Much like Alistair, who was sharing earlier, I had a terrible fear of flying uh, for so many years. Uh, when I think about the way that God handles our lives, my brother wanted to go around the world, I was quite happy to be at home, and now uh, he's at home and I go around the world. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and the thing about it is that, is that all those years that uh, traveling, um, David traveled with me for many of those years to many, many countries. I think sometimes when I used to think when we come back to the local church, if only folks knew some of the stories, some of the things that we used to get up to, and uh, the amazing miracles that God did, that would, that would match anything you would meet that or read of in any Christian bookshop, just the most amazing testimonies of what God did, of the thousands and tens of thousands who came to Christ. And David really, you know, I used to say to him, David, I don't mind going to a war zone, but don't put me on a 747, you know. And yeah, he loved it. He just loved it. He was totally up for anything and everything. And, and I can remember the day when, uh, again, we had seen God do some amazing things in Kenya. And we were then going, it was coming close the very next day. We were going to be flying on to Zimbabwe. And um, we had actually been into a really dangerous area. And... Uh, We'd seen God do some amazing things, and yet here we were, and I it was just literally the day before going, and I'm praying again over every aspect of the flying. <laughs> just this is amazing how fear can drive me to do stuff. And uh, finally, David just said to me, John, what's the issue? And I began to speak out of some of my fears. And he just began to minister to me and pray for the love of the Father to touch my heart and my life. And I was set free that day from the fear of flying. I've done many, 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 many flights since that day and never suffered again with the fear of flying. I thank God for David's ministry to me. He, he was such a close and dear friend. Uh, just so we know that we've heard so many wonderful things about him here. But my memories of David are, are both as a close friend, a constant source of encouragement, a partner in, in ministry, um, you know, whether it was standing before large crowds or uh, or prophesying over a small group. Uh, it was always great fun to prophesy with David. He would always provoke you to more. Whatever we thought that you had to minister, he would always let the viewers smile and say, and, <laughs> <laughs> expecting to get more. Uh, it was always that way. Uh, and it was a great joy to provoke one another. I have to admit that in the, in the years then when uh, Elaine and I left Surrey and went up to the West Midlands, and in the times even before that, when Dave took on the church and we were no longer able to travel so much together, I felt like my right arm had been cut off. He was just such a close friend. And uh, of course, he stood by me, with me, through the darkest times and the most difficult times of my life. And uh, believed in me when others didn't. Stood by me, spoke well of me, encouraged me. In fact, so much so, some people used to think he was my bodyguard. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and of course, if I was ever hungry after a meeting, he was always at hand to cook something rather pleasant. <laughs> he was just a tremendous, tremendous guy. I also owe a great debt to David and Sheena for introducing me in so many real ways to the Holy Spirit. 
Um, growing up in Chief Fellowship as it was in those days, because everybody spoke in tongues, and uh, I didn't want to see appear to be the person who was the old one out, and so I made up my own language, you know. And, um, and so I can remember whenever we were encouraged to speak in tongues, and I, I would kind of, you know, shamba 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 or something of that nature. And uh, until one day, about two, three years later, my, I was uncovered in a, a youth meeting round at David's flat. Well, it was, uh, it was one of those social times that tended to focus again around food. And um, we had fish and chips and we were sitting there together and then right at the end of the day we said, guys, let's just put an arm around each other and close by praying in tongues. And David was right next to me. I thought, oh no. <laughs> and, and I remember as I'm standing there with my eyes closed, he was there. And if you've ever had the feeling of somebody who's actually uh, looking at you and you have your eyes closed and you can tell that they're looking at you. It was that feeling. And David did have a way of looking at you in which you kind of felt that he was reading your mail. And, um, and I suddenly just opened one eye, looked up, and there he was, looking right down at me. And he said, John, I don't think that's tongues, is it? I said, oh, strangely enough. And um, suddenly there were all these hands laid on me, you know, and before long I was speaking in other tongues. And thank God for that. Because really, over the years then, he taught me so much. And in the little, in the kids groups that we had, the days, the wonderful days of Super Game, and uh, Dave and Sheena taught us so much about how to listen to the Holy Spirit. And I'm utterly indebted uh, in God to them for that as we've gone on through the years uh, in ministry. So I just really am here to say a big thank you to the Lord for David. He was a tremendous mentor. A tremendous worship leader. David was just passionate, absolutely passionate about Jesus. And to watch him worship and bring the presence of God was a pure delight. To worship with him was even greater. I can uh, say that I have enjoyed some of the songs that we have sung this afternoon. We sung around the world. We sang around the world together and saw God's glory come in so many ways. There are times over these current days, of course, when I look back and consider the memories, and of course they bring tears. But then when I close my eyes and I picture him worshipping in glory, I get such joy come off on the inside. I don't really view these times as saying goodbye. I prefer the French version of au revoir, <laughs> because we will meet again. And that will be a glorious reunion. She now, over the many, many years, she shared him with me. Releasing him to go on being left at home so many times. I know you came with us at times. And uh, of course, Dave and I were doing so much at times, and, and you were wondering sometimes, what am I going to do here and there? I just wanted to say that you're an amazing woman. Yeah. And we just, we all honor you. And I just want to say thank you for the years you shared him as well. Mm -hmm. The Lord bless you. Uh, we were listening to Bruce earlier at the Bruce Oliver earlier at the crematorium, and Bruce said that he was involved very much in the earlier part of Dave's life and in the latter part, and that also is the same situation with me. We our lives took slightly different parts. Um, but I first came across Dave in summer '75. I'd just become a Christian, and I'd just joined what was then known as Gene Fellowship. And Dave was wrestling with this whole concept of getting away from playing music with the piano, but playing music by the Spirit. And it was, I tell you, it was unique. It was unique. And the more he persevered, the more he persevered, the more we felt the Spirit of God come down until not just Dave and me and others, the whole congregation could be lost in the worship of God as Dave played his piano. And we give thanks for that, Jonathan, and we were all there. And we really want to honour you, Dave, for persevering and pressing through. There were lots of things we had to persevere and press through with. Our wedding came. It was, I can only say it was unique. It was, and, and at our wedding, people looked at the cake and they said, that's unique. It was round, it was square, it had swans, it had several tears. It was unique. It was a marvel to behold. Not long after our wedding, Marilyn and I, uh, we obtained a rabbit. It was just a small little rabbit, but it grew and it grew and it grew 
until it turned into a big buck rabbit. And um, uh, it was a colleague, a little boy, gave it to her from a school in Dorking. And we were going on holiday, and I said, Dave, would you mind feeding the rabbit? We're going away. He said, that's no problem, I'll feed the rabbit. We came back two weeks later, he said, that rabbit, he said, don't you ever let me near that rabbit again. Said, I've locked it in the shed. What I do is I open the shed door, I throw the food in. <laughs> Father, we're here today to say thank you. Thank you for the gift of David. Thank you for the gift of David's life. Lord, for the impact that he has had on so many of our lives here today. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of this family. We honour them before you, Lord, as we honour David before you, and thank you for all that you have done in and through his life, and for all that you have done, Lord, in the lives of the Palethorpe family in their lives and through their lives, to each one of us. Father, we do pray that today that you would strengthen them, that you would comfort them. Lord, in times both of grief and in times of joy, in times of remembering all of the wonderful memories of David's life, to remember with thanksgiving, yes, Lord, in that process of healing that goes on in our hearts, when we remember with tears and yet remember also with joy. Yet, Father, I pray that in the days we... Pray together and agree together that from this day forth, that Lord David and she, sorry, Sheena and Steve, Lord, and the whole family would just know the comfort, Maria, the whole family would know the comfort of the Holy Spirit, yes. would know your presence surrounding them, Lord, giving them peace, giving them comfort, giving them joy, giving them hope and vision for the future. Lord, we just thank you that everything that you have started in their lives and everything that they have experienced together. Yet, Lord, there is so much more yet to come that you're going to do through their lives, even as a family. We bless them today. We thank you for them again. And we give you the praise and the glory for David's life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing within the six of songs of worship. Our vats 
about the flag with mine. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty fervent. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and fruits. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This was David's life, wasn't it? He wanted to praise the Lord with every ounce of his flesh, with everything that he could. And he used to say to me, darling, I know you don't like the loud disco, so it's going to be louder than that, isn't it? And I thought, whoa! But yes, it was a life word to, to praise and to worship the Lord. And Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. David was always saying, My sheep, hear my voice. I know my sheep hear my voice, and Jesus says, I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Yes. What a wonderful promise for us who believe. Never to be snatched out of the Father's hand. And I'm going to finish with words that have already been spoken. <coughs> Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. That has been our family's cry. Always look for the best to encourage, to build up, to strengthen. Think about what is honourable and what is true. Bless God for this amazing word. Chapel, Chief Community Church, it was known, 
And I thought back, I remember one time when we had a group, we invited a group to come over from South Africa. It was their first place. They went on to minister in huge venues around the country, but they ministered first of all in little old Elmwood down the road. And uh, it was a worship concert, and as they came uh, in, they ministered, and halfway through, all of a sudden, everything changed. It was like the Bible talks about the Spirit of God being like a wind, like the wind of the Spirit. It was like a wind of the Spirit came into that place, and all of a sudden, the huge big windows in Elbrook, it was a still day, there wasn't a breath of wind. All these windows, something like that, and all of them opened at absolutely once. And the Spirit of God began to fall on people. Folk fell off their chairs, people fell backwards, fell on the floor, and God began to minister, and lives encouraged and strengthened and built up and changed. God is an awesome God. The times that he, that when David's been ministering in worship, as Tony referred to, we stood in Elbrook there at times, and the presence of God has come down so strong that when it's been time to come and share the word, sometimes I've just stood there, unable to speak, damn speak, waiting for permission to speak from the Lord. And sometimes the permission wasn't given, and we spend our whole time just in, in worship with God taking over the meeting. One season, one season when the Lord really moved us in an amazing way over several weeks at a time. The people in that place, sometimes with David ministry, sometimes my daughter ministry, sometimes others ministry on the piano, whatever, but the Spirit of God there so strong. People laid out on the floor all over Elbrook, had to be helped up out of the place, like midnight and even after, so help to their cars and to sit there and recover, and others carried into their cars and to sit there and wait and recover. God is an awesome and magnificent God. Remember one time trying to get this message out to the district, we took Jonathan's great thousand seater tent and got permission to put it up in Ching Park. And we had this, uh, this crew come over from America, look, a producer and a director of this thing called, uh, somewhat dramatic title, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Well, they trained us on to do this, and at the end of that, when the appeal was given, we were there, and the place was flooded. This in Cheen, Cheen, middle class Cheen, flooded with people coming down to the front to make decisions for Jesus. So much we had to vacate the stage as people could come up there. And so it went, and so it went on. Awesome times. And all of this is just a foretaste of things to come because God is awesomely real. Jesus is alive. Calvary, the cross, the crucifixion 2,000 years ago wasn't the end, but it was the beginning of a whole new day. Someone has once said a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And the reality is that when you know that you know, it's an awesome thing. But the evidence is also overwhelming. And the reality and power of the resurrection has captured the hearts and minds of people from every walks of life down through human history, back down the centuries, from people like cobblers, farmers, um, cooks, uh, you know, writers, artists, philosophers, the finest legal minds, because the evidence is overwhelming. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I receive what I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And so he goes on. This is overwhelming evidence. And you know, the last, uh, and this carries right up to our present day, the previous leader and the current leader of the hugely successful and influential Holy Spirit Brompton Church in, um, in London are both ex-barristers, men who have given up a lucrative 
successful career in the law to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because the evidence of reality is overwhelming. Praise the Lord. Let's just hear the scriptures, the witnesses of the resurrection. John says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That gospel, Paul says, of which you've taken your stand, gives us a whole new view of life, our journey, our destination and the future. The two key elements, Christ died for our sins. Nobody's perfect, but Christ, the perfect one, took our place and stood in the gap so that we could come to the Father. And he rose again the third day. Sometime before I knew him, David opened his life to Jesus Christ and took his stand, and that changed his life forever. And he's followed the Lord with faith and passion ever since, and now he's in his presence. The scripture depicts those who have gone before as a great cloud of witnesses. And Hebrews says this, Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, and I want as I close, give you these three things. I can imagine David up here wanting to urge you the same three things that Hebrews says here. First of all, to throw off everything and anything that hinders or prevents you walking with God, receiving God, and going on with the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it's bad relationships, whether it's something you're tangled up in, whatever it is that's hindering you, get rid of it and find Jesus Christ and walk on with him. And you know, one of the things that can hinder us is trying to work out everything. You know, the Bible prepared us for the fact we have to live in mystery sometimes, by saying that the, right early on, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. I don't know, we don't know why David has been taken at this time. We'd love to know, but we're never going to know all things. We're never going to know the answers to these questions until that day when, having lived seen through a glass dimly as it were, we see face to face and we're known as we are known. In that day it will be made clear. In the meantime we have to live with mystery but run with the things we do know and the things which are revealed. And that's what David did. He ran with that which is revealed, which is glorious and wonderful. And he said the same as what Bruce was saying to us earlier, to run with him, run with Jesus, Run in your faith and open yourself to everything that he has for you. And secondly, it says, run with perseverance the race marked out for us. David lived believing and he died believing. What a glorious way to go. And you saw just recently, he let nothing stand in the way. Even though he wasn't well, he came out of a hospice only a short while ago to go to Holland and do this uh, prophetic conference. Awesome brother. He's been with me all these years and he's just, he's been a privilege. And the final thing is this, fix, as we run, as we throw up a thing, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. There's something about fixing your eyes upon Jesus. There's something about looking to him. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the light. He's our light. In his light we see light. He's our standard. He's our goal. He's our destination. He's the great love of our life. He's the one who's brought us to the Father. Fix our eyes upon Jesus. That's how David lived. And that's how he died, looking unto Jesus. The scripture says this, He who has the Son has the life, God's kind of life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have this life.
Do you have the Son? Do you have life? Your answer to that question is the secret or contains the answer to your destiny. I urge you, as David would say, if you were here right now, receive Jesus. Open up to him because he stands at the door of your life. He knocks at that door and he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and sup with him. That's a personal promise to each and every one in his place. When I heard that David had passed away, the first words that came to my mind was the great declaration, death has been swallowed up in victory. Because anything and everything that David has suffered so bravely and in such faith these last months is now swallowed up in his sharing of the victory of eternal resurrection life which he now enjoys in the presence of the God and Saviour whom he loved and served. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's walk that way ourselves. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless you. Amen. Amen.
which is that one day all of us will die. And that is true. And so, uh, as my father's just spoken, as we've heard all of these testimonies of David's great assurance that he knew Jesus Christ, I would have finished today praying simply. And a very simple prayer that there may be those of us here today who say, I don't have that assurance today. I really don't. I don't think they'll be singing like this at my view. I have no clue where I'm going. But today, the Bible talks of the gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And it's as simple as that, receiving a gift. Open my heart to Jesus. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, please forgive me. Come into my life, and I want to follow you. Beginning a journey. And amazing, beginning it today of all days. So I'm going to pray, first of all, for those of you here today, I'm not going to ask you to respond publicly here, but if that is you today, you pray the simple prayer. Please feel free to speak to me or anyone in the family at the end of the service. And after that, I'd like to just pray for all of us. So as I pray this very simple prayer, I'd like you to be able to echo that in your heart, just between you and God right now. Maybe you're even backslidden away from God. Today, you can come back to Him. I'll pause as I say each, each thing and just echo your own heart. Almighty God, I come to you. I thank you for David's life. Thank you that he knew you. I want to know you. And I want to know forgiveness. And I'm opening my heart to you today. Please forgive me. And come into my life. Thank you for accepting me today. Amen. Amen. Just want to pray for all of us. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies and abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And the legacy of David is in all of our lives. The Spirit of God, the memory of faith, of a life given over to God in obedience and faith. And I know that's going to bear fruit, that life all around the world. And so, Father, we just thank you for our brother, David, today. We thank you as a hero of faith, as it were, he stands like those other Hebrews 11 heroes, urging us on to follow Jesus. And to throw off everything that hinders and to run with perseverance. And Lord, we say to you today, that's what we choose to do. And so, Father, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.